see a nice group picture of his group of uh, co-investigators there. Um, our next speaker is uh, Pete Gianeros. Um, uh, Pete's a uh, professor of psychology and the director of the Multimodal Neuroimaging Training Program at the University of Pittsburgh. He holds faculty appointments in the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition, the Center for Neuroscience, and the Department of Psychiatry. Pete's work has focused on the neurobiology of psychosocial stress, emotion, socio socioeconomic health disparities, and cardiovascular disease risk. This focus has encompassed studies of how the brain functionally regulates and represents autonomic, immune, and cardiovascular stress responses, how the brain influences and is influenced by biological and behavioral risk factors for chronic illness, and how the brain links socioeconomic inequalities to health over the lifespan. His work has resulted in over 90 publications integrating approaches from multimodal brain imaging, psychophysiology, epidemiology, behavioral and basic laboratory approaches. He's received the Herbert Wiener Early Career Award from the American Psychosomatic Society in 2008 and the Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contributions to Psychology from the American Psychological Association in 2010. The title of Pete's presentation is The Neurobiology of Socioeconomic Health Disparity. Can everyone hear me? Great. Thank you, Liz, for that very uh, kind introduction. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Um, what I'm going to do today is describe uh, some example findings from a line of research that we've been conducting for a little over 10 years now that is directed at understanding the neurobiology of socioeconomic health disparities with a particular focus on cardiovascular health disparities. And uh, to do that, I've organized today's talk into uh, three parts. Uh, first, I'll provide a little bit of a context, a conceptual context for the questions that we've been asking. And then I'll provide an example of some findings from a recent study that we completed that illustrates um, the kind of work that we do. And then I'll talk a little bit about where I hope to see this work going in the future. Okay. Uh, so to provide some context, um, what, what we're doing, the work that we're doing, the context for it, is situated at the interface of two bodies of research that have been largely independent uh, for some time now. The first body of research has to do with socioeconomic health, dis um, health disparities. And, you know, we've known for decades that life expectancy, risk factors for chronic illnesses, chronic illnesses uh, track a, a socioeconomic uh, gradient. And uh, this, the second body of research that's independent, that's been largely independent from socioeconomic health disparities research is a more recent line of neuroscience research uh, showing that a number of risk factors for chronic illnesses, particularly heart disease, like systemic inflammation, components of the metabolic syndrome like adiposity, blood pressure, insulin resistance, and so forth, as well as dysregulated autonomic function, um, sedentary behavior, smoking behaviors, and preclinical atherosclerosis, all of these risk factors uh, can come to adversely affect brain function and brain structure. But we know from the literature that I just mentioned that all of these risk factors track a socioeconomic gradient. So much of the neuroscience research that has been focused on these risk factors in the context of their adverse effects on brain um, health have largely ignored the fact that these risk factors track a socioeconomic gradient. And in fact, you're lucky to even see a lot of these um, uh, studies use SCS, something like education, income as a covariate as best. So it's in this context that we've been trying to integrate these two lines of research to better understand uh, some of the environmental, psychosocial, uh, behavioral, and biological um, pathways that might link relative socioeconomic disadvantage to risk factors for disease and how variation along these pathways and in these risk factors um, that are socioeconomically patterned might come to adversely affect brain function and brain structure over the lifespan. So this is the broader conceptual framework um, for, for the questions that we've been asking. In our work, um, we, we treat SCS, like many others in the field, as a multidimensional and multi-level construct that might come to influence health in, in addition to brain function and structure throughout the life course. 
So we investigate, in terms of its multidimensional um, nature, we investigate, investigate SCS along uh, dimensions of um, wealth, um, financial dimensions, occupational prestige and status, as well as educational attainment. We recognize that you can measure SES along these lines, both with objective measures and subjective measures. In our work, we treat SES as a multi-level construct, um, as illustrated uh, by the work that Jean just presented, where you can measure SES at the level of the individual, the household, the community, and at higher levels of, of social um, assembly. And you know, we recognize that SES can come to influence health, brain function, brain structure, uh, throughout life, and there might be period-specific effects for the influence of SES on these kinds of outcomes. And we've, we've tried to investigate a range of correlates um, of risk for socioeconomic status in this work uh, as well. Um, so now what I'll do is walk you through some example findings from a study that, that we recently completed that illustrates the, the kind of questions that we've been trying to, to wrestle with over the years. And uh, this work was recently reported in a publication in uh, Cerebral Cortex. Um, it, it came out, it appeared last year, but it's in press now. And in this study, what we tried to do was treat SES as a multi-level construct in asking the question of whether community or neighborhood socioeconomic disadvantage might relate to aspects of brain morphology that have been linked to premature cognitive decline, dementia risk, and so forth and whether there are particular biological pathways that might link area-level disadvantage to these aspects of, of brain morphology. So as many of you know, and as, as Jean pointed out, um, there's a large body of research linking area-level socioeconomic disadvantage, so this would be disadvantage measured at the level of neighborhoods and communities and so forth, um, to risk for a number of chronic illnesses, um, stroke, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, premature mortality, and so forth. And there's an emerging literature. It's not uniformly consistent, but there are some studies to suggest that living in uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged areas might confer risk for premature cognitive decline and possibly uh, dementia. What's interesting in this literature is that the area-level risks that are conferred for adverse health outcomes are often independent of individual level factors, including you know, a person's own educational attainment, uh, their wealth, their income, their occupational prestige, and so forth. So that suggests that there's something unique about the area um, that might be conferring risk that's independent of a person's own uh, SES. However, um, an open question is whether the, the risks conferred by area level disadvantage might extend to the brain um, whether these risks might be independent of a person's own uh, socioeconomic status, as, as has been demonstrated in epidemiological studies. And um, it's an entirely open question that if area-level disadvantage might relate to aspects of brain function and structure, what are the mechanistic pathways, um, which would have implications for interventions um, and, and so forth that we can talk about a little bit later. So these were the primary questions that we sought to address in, in this particular study. And we focused, um, we used geocoding methods that I'll describe in a little bit to um, uh, compute metrics of area level disadvantage derived from census data in the neighborhoods where people lived. Um, and we looked at aspects of brain morphology that I'll describe um, that have been linked to aspects of, of neurocognitive aging and, and dementia risk and so forth. And the pathways that we focused on um, encompassed uh, risk for cardiometabolic disease with a specific focus on components of the metabolic syndrome that um, have been linked in epidemiological studies to area level disadvantage in, and that's in one body of research. And then separately, these same risk factors have been linked to alterations in brain morphology um, in neuroscience studies. So there are basically two bodies of, of, of literature that essentially aren't talking to each other that have separately linked cardiometabolic risk to area disadvantage and brain morphology. Um, another pathway that we focused on involved um, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And here where our interest was in uh, metrics of cortisol, which is a stress hormone that has been tied to some indicators of area disadvantage in one literature and then separately to aspects of um, brain morphology, uh, brain aging, and cognition in a separate literature. So these are the pathways that we focused on in this study. 
And we also, again, wanted to address the question of whether um, area disadvantage might relate to aspects of brain morphology through these pathways and whether these effects might be independent of a person's own educational attainment, their own um, occupational grade, as well as their own uh, household income. And we also uh, asked whether these effects were moderated or accounted for simply by a person's age um, and, and their gender. So to address these questions, we studied um, 448 people from the Adult Health and Behavior uh, Project, phase two. This is a, a community sample adults from the Pittsburgh area um, for whom we have um, detailed biological, neural, um, psychosocial correlates uh, of risk. This is a midlife, um, very healthy sample. All of them were employed and worked um, uh, 25 or more hours per week. There were no night shift workers, which could affect the release of glucocorticoids like cortisol over the course of the day. Um, they were mostly Caucasian. Uh, most, most of them had never smoked. All of them were extensively screened uh, for the existence of any chronic illness that could um, impact uh, any of the pathways that we're interested in along with brain function or structure. And none of them were currently on uh, any medications that could affect our, our outcomes. So it's an extremely healthy uh, community-based midlife sample. Um, as I mentioned, we use geocoding uh, to derive uh, a, an index of community-level disadvantage. So this is um, Allegheny County, and the University of Pittsburgh is situated in Allegheny County. Each dot on um, uh, this uh, figure represents where someone lived in Allegheny County in the AHAB-2 sample. So we linked uh, street addresses to census metrics of the percentage of people who were unemployed um, in a person's census tract, the number of uh, households, the percentage of households that were beneath the federal poverty line, the number of households that were on public assistance. So for example, the percentage of people receiving food stamps, um, supplemental nutritional assistance, and so forth. The percentage of people who were 25 or older without a high school education, as well as the median household income, which was uh, reverse uh, coded. So we standardized, we did factor analyses and standardized all of these um, to come up with an aggregate disadvantage score. So the higher the score, the more disadvantage in that person's community. Um, there, we had uh, 213 uh, different uh, census tracts represented in the AHAB-2 sample with about two people uh, per tract. And there were about uh, 1,500 households per tract in this sample. Um, our, to compute aspects of uh, HPA access regulation, we, um, we measured uh, salivary cortisol uh, at awakening, 30 minutes after awakening, four hours after awakening, nine hours after awakening, and then at bedtime. And the normal variation in cortisol over the course of the day looks something like this. So from these assessments, we derived uh, three indicators of HPA access activity. One was the percentage of the rise in cortisol um, from awakening until 30 minutes afterward. Another indicator was a slope of the diurnal um, decrease in cortisol over the course of the day across these assessments. Uh, a flatter slope is indicative of glucocorticoid dysregulation and a steeper slope is more indicative of the normative decline or, or regulated uh, release of, of cortisol over the course of the day. And then finally, we just looked at total glucocorticoid output, and so we computed an area under the curve uh, for these cortisol assessments taken over the course of the day. Um, these are not in interchangeable um, measures, as you can see by their moderate to low correlation. Uh, between the measures. So they, they represent something slightly different about HPA access over the course of the day. With respect to cardiometabolic risk, uh, we assessed major dimensions of the metabolic syndrome. So we computed measures of blood pressure, adiposity comprised of body mass index and waist circumference. Um, we assessed dyslipidemia by looking at high density lipoprotein uh, as well as triglycerides. Um, we assessed glu fasting glucose and fasting insulin as well. So we standardize and average these metrics to come up with an aggregate cardiometabolic risk score, um, which we've done in, in our prior work. In terms of uh, the brain imaging metrics, we uh, looked at aspects of brain morphology that are relevant from a neurocognitive uh, aging perspective. 
So we looked at aspects of cortical morphology, and in today's talk, I'm going to focus mainly on um, total cortical gray matter volume. We also looked at things like cortical surface area and cortical thickness, which I would be happy to talk about in the question and answer period. And then we also looked at uh, subcortical brain regions, particularly the amygdala and the hippocampus, as Gene mentioned, uh, for reasons that um, have to do with these areas being implicated as sensitive to stress, and um, they've been indicted as culprits that might link socioeconomic disadvantage to stress-related pathways to risk uh, as well. So these were the areas of the brain that we were particularly interested in. We used path analysis uh, in a multiple mediator framework. Um, to test whether area disadvantage predicted variation in brain morphology across the sample with two parallel mediators, our aggregate indicator of cardiometabolic risk, as well as our indicators of HPA axis activity. Uh, we covaried for age, sex, individual level SES indicators, as well as intracranial uh, volume, so total vault size. Um, also, in ancillary analyses, we scrambled the um, outcome variables and mediators to test which model might fit the data uh, best for reasons that I'll explain in a little bit. Okay, so in terms of results, we actually saw no correlations, no associations between um, total subcortical uh, brain tissue volume, hippocampal volume, and amygdala volume with area disadvantage, cardiometabolic risk, any of our cortisol metrics um, after you controlled for age, sex, individual level SES, and uh, intracranial volume. I should say, in other analyses, we actually did find that individual-level SES variables did track with amygdala and hippocampal volume. Um, so it might be the case that individual-level factors track with these subcortical metrics, but not area-level uh, metrics. And we're not entirely clear what the pathways might be that would connect individual-level SES with these subcortical uh, metrics. In terms of cortical uh, brain tissue volume, we saw that greater disadvantage was associated with reduced cortical uh, gray matter volume. This was also true for reduced white matter volume, reduced cortical surface area, and reduced cortical thickness. So there appears to be um, sort of this um, blunt instrument association between area disadvantage and gross reductions in uh, cortical morphology. We also saw that the greater the cardiometabolic risk, um, the lower the cortical tissue volume, and then of the cortisol uh, metrics, it was only a, a flatter slope, so a more dysregulated um, uh, release of cortisol over the course of the day that was associated with a reduction in uh, cortical tissue volume. And all these associations were independent of our covariates, um, particularly individual level SES. So there appears to be something unique, um, as I'll mention, about the community in these associations. In a multiple mediator model, we found evidence consistent with um, parallel mediation, such that area disadvantage related to reduced cortical tissue volume, and this association was accounted for um, both by cardiometabolic risk as well as a flatter diurnal decline in cortisol over the course of the day. And um, I should also say that even after accounting for all of our covariates and um, these two mediators, there was still an, a residual association such that higher disadvantage related to reduced cortical volume um, uh, irrespective of cardiometabolic risk and diurnal slope. So that suggests that there might be other mediators at play. Um, as I mentioned, we scrambled the mediators and the outcome variable. Um, so we basically put brain morphology uh, measures as the mediators and um, cardiometabolic risk and diurnal slope and cortisol metrics as the outcomes. And um, when, we, when we reversed the variables in this way, we, we found no evidence consistent with the brain being a mediator. So it appears that the brain is best represented as a target or outcome variable here. Okay. Um, and I should say that these um, mediators were independent of one another, so there was no correlation at all between the cortisol slope and cardiometabolic risk, so it suggests that they're independent. The effects generalized throughout the brain, so they were consistent across hemispheres, across all four cortical lobes. Um, we controlled for IQ, and we still saw these associations, uh, so we think that's incompatible with an indirect selection model that we can talk about. Um, none of these psychosocial factors, like positive or negative affect, sleep quality, um, social network diversity, 
Um, when we controlled for those, we still saw all of these mediated effects. And even when we controlled for the other cortisol metrics, we still saw these effects. So they appear to be quite robust and independent of these. In separate analyses that were unpublished, we found that greater area disadvantage um, was negatively related to neuropsychological performance on tests of spatial reasoning, short-term memory, and executive function. And we recently um, submitted, resubmitted an application to do longitudinal follow-ups in this sample um, to test whether the brain um, and some of these mediators might link area disadvantage to these neurocognitive um, outcomes in this, uh, in this midlife aging population. So, area disadvantage appears to be related to reduced cortical gray matter volume. Mediating paths might, be, might encompass um, aspects of cardiometabolic risk as well as neuroendocrine disruptions. We think our findings uh, fit with area-level models of health inequalities right now, um, and we extend these models to encompass aspects of brain morphology. It's possible from um, these models that our cardiometabolic risk uh, might be associated with aspects of the environment that favor energy imbalance. So for example, in areas of disadvantage, there are fewer um, places for exercise uh, to safely. Um, so it might be uh, involved, this pathway might encompass in this environmental pathway. In some studies, particularly um, work by Anna Diaz-Rue, uh, she's shown that neighborhood violence and lack of safety are associated with a flatter um, diurnal slope, and they've shown that neighborhood poverty relates to neuro these neuroendocrine disruptions um, via increases in neighborhood violence. So it's possible that our HPA findings might map on to a safety or stress-related pathway to influence brain health. In terms of where we'd like to see this work go, we think that this work has implications for understanding brain-based outcomes, such as cognitive aging and dementia, that might be socioeconomically patterned. Um, we think that this work illustrates how neuroscience can provide complementary evidence um, to what's being shown in the disparities literature with respect to early or preclinical changes um, that you know, manifest themselves prior to clinical outcomes. And uh, we do hope that, um, working, that more neuroscientists will have a greater um, interest in health disparities. We, we hope that health disparities researchers will become more interested in applying neuroscience work like that we've shown here. And um, we'd also think that this work should encourage more integrative um, training as well as longitudinal research. So training young investigators in neuroscience and health disparities methods we think will be particularly fruitful. Thank you all for your time.